Good morning, church. Good morning, church. It is a pleasure to uh, be in God's house this morning to um, celebrate his name, uh, to celebrate the victory that we have in um, his blood. His death and resurrection was for me, was for you, was for the entire world. And that's why we welcome you this morning in our worship service as we sing praises to him. And for those of you who will be watching us on YouTube, we pray that uh, the Holy Spirit will be with you as you uh, uh, join us in our worship spirit. Let us rise together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for your blessings and thank you for this day and thank you for the promise that you made to us your mercy is new every morning in our life so as you we, we go to sleep and wake up and we always know it is not about us it is all about you we pray that your holy spirit will be among us this morning as we sing praises to you and listen to your word May those who are in, on the way, Lord God, be rushed to come and to experience this wonderful time with not only your Holy Spirit and yourself, but with also the fellow believers among us. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. What can wash away my sin? Hymn number 69. It is our opening hymn this morning. Hymn number 69. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me bright as snow. No other fault I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my cleansing, this my plea Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow That makes me bright as snow No other fount I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me bright as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me bright as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. No relationship, no wealth, no friendship, no connections can wipe away our sin. Nothing, nothing but the blood of our Lord 
and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why when we come to his presence, we are confident that we will be reminded of this wonderful, all this, of this ultimate truth that we have in our life, that his blood can take away our sins. Amen? That's why as a, as in our time of confession and absolution, I invite you to sit or to kneel as we confess before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, all our sins, none and unknown. My brothers and sisters and fellow saints, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let us now confess our sins before our gracious Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have sinned against you in things we have done and left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us. Renew us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. My brothers and sisters and fellow saints, in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. God is merciful. Therefore, as a call and ordained servant, I give voice to his grace and grant you the full forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. I am free to serve. Amen. We are free. This is certain. This is true. This is a trustworthy saying. You are forgiven and you are forgiven indeed. Amen? Okay, as we go into our prayer time, we will remember the church in general, the call that God has put in our hearts and his church and the mission that we have to carry his message throughout the world. First, we'll start in our home, in our community, where the church is exactly and then we will move forward throughout the world. We'll remember our pastors. We'll remember those who are called to lead God's people. And we'll remember also this country and the leaders of this country. And we'll remember uh, what the promise God has for us. He is the one who put the leaders in place. So we follow them according to his will. Let us go to God in prayer this morning. Almighty and everlasting God, look with compassion on your church. Protect your children from an evil, unbelieving heart that would lead us away from you into the deceitful of sin. By your Spirit's power, enable us to hold our original confidence firm to the end. Lord, in your mercy, O Lord, God of hosts, keep us from hating those you send to reprove us with your law. Do not let us abhor those who speak your truth to us, that we might repent and leave. Lord, in your mercy, 
Heavenly Father, your Son warns us against the danger of trusting in wealth and earthly goods. Give us hearts that are content with his promises and hands that are generous to with our worldly possessions. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, in your kindness, remember the president of our country, our Congress and judges, and all who bear office in this land. Protect them from the temptations of power and wealth that would lead them away from their calling. Make their service a blessing to our land and its people. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, have mercy on us, have mercy on your church, have mercy on the families of this church. We pray to you for those who are sick and shut in. We pray to you for those who are visiting us. We pray to you for those of God who are at home, who would love to be here in your presence to worship you, but physically they are unable. But we believe, Lord God, that you are the great physician. We pray that your mighty hand will go and touch them and let them feel your presence, let them feel your spirit in their life. All your servant afflicted in body or soul. Satisfy them with your steadfast love in Christ and grant health and healing in accord with your perfect will. Lord, in your mercy. Holy Lord, we pray that you satisfy our long hearts with your steadfast love here in the feast of Christ, body and blood, that we may rejoice and be glad in you all our days and into eternity. Lord, in your mercy, we give thanks to you, O Lord, for the faithful of every time and place who heard your word and held their conf confidence firm to the end. Keep us steadfast in, faith, in the faith that we may have our share with them in the eternal inheritance that you have promised. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, and who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. It is wonderful to have uh, this confidence. We're going to God, not worrying about whether we were worthy of his presence, but because of his son, through his son, Jesus Christ, we have that opportunity. We have that privilege. That's why we, every time, every moment we, we need to go before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in a relationship that he, uh, his Son, Jesus Christ, has given to us. Now it is time for us to go to God's Word. Our first lesson is coming from Amos chapter 5, verses 6 and 7 and 10 through 15. In your pew Bibles, it will be page 1425 or 1430. And the second lesson, Hebrews chapter 3, uh, verses 12 through 19. Pew Bible, page 1863 or 1865. And after that, our brother Joe will be playing a selection, and I will be reading the gospel from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 22. And here our brother, Brother Mark, uh, Max, will be reading our first two lessons. Good morning, church. Good morning. All right, let us know you're there at uh, Amos 5 by saying amen. Amen. All right. 
Seek the Lord and live, or he will sweep through the tribes of Joseph like a fire. It will devour them, and Bethel will have no one to quench it. There are those who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. There are those who hate the one who upholds justice in court and detest the one who tells the truth. You levy a straw tax on the poor and impose a tax on their grain. Therefore, though you have built some mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. For I know how many are your offenses and how great your sins. There are those who oppress the innocent and take bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Therefore, the prudent keep quiet in such times, for the times are evil. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you, just as you say he is. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, our next reading is in Hebrews, found on 1863 or 1865. Let me know you're there by saying amen. Amen. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As has has just been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all that those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brother Joe, now we rise for the gospel, our gospel lesson this morning coming from Mark chapter 10, uh, verses 17 through 22. 
page 1570 or 1574. Let me know when you're there by saying amen. As Jesus started his way, a man went up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Now we confess our faith in the, uh, the Apostles' Creed, and this confession is for, for is to glorify our Father in heaven. Number two is to have a better understanding of the object of our faith. Number two. Three is to be able to express our faith to others. And number four is to know what we are testifying to as we verbalize our faith in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. This is my confession and belief. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Together we share the peace of God with everyone around you. The peace of the Lord be with you. Amen. Please, you may be seated. Our, clo our uh, sermon hymn is... Come thou fount of every blessing. Hymn number 108. Hymn 108. Come thou fount of every blessing. True my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee may I still thy goodness prove here I praise my Ebenezer either by thy help I come and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. 
He took rescue me from danger, interposed His precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace now, like a feather, bind my wandering heart to Thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you this morning for your blessings. Thank you for this moment spending in your presence. And thank you for your word. And thank you for uh, using your servant, Lord God, to uh, share a word from you to your people. We pray that you open our hearts, open our mind as we hear your word. May we receive it so like as food coming, as manna coming from heaven, so that we will be so blessed, so full, that we will be strong to go and share your good news wherever we go. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our gospel lesson this morning, Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through um, 22, brings us the, uh, together into a very powerful and deeply personal encounter, as we hear the story, between Jesus Christ and a rich man seeking something that we all have because of the relationship that we have with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, seeking eternal life. We are told in this story that the man ran up and, to Jesus and knelt. This man's urgency and reverence towards Jesus suggests that he recognized something extraordinary in Jesus, about Jesus. But as we dig in the text into this passage profoundly, we discover also a tension between the man's sincere desire for eternal life and also his inability to let go of the things that ultimately held him captive. So you are seeking eternal life, but at the same time, there are things in this world that held him captive. So until he let go of these things, it would be impossible for him to grasp or receive the answer he's looking for. So the rich man's question to Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life. So this man going to Jesus, asking this question, what, what must I do? But according to the text, the man is a rich man. So this man, he had everything. He had wealth. He had status. And likely influence in his community. And according to the text also, he told us that he, told us he was also um, someone who would, uh, ab was able to bring judgment or to uh, settle dispute among the community. And yet, despite all his material abundance, something was missing. And that's why he had to seek Jesus Christ, to ask questions, to figure out, what is the problem? What is going on in my life? I have everything that I need on this earth, on this planet, but I am missing something. So he knew that his riches and moral accomplishments could not secure him eternal life. But the question he poses to Jesus, 
what must I do to inherit eternal life? And this question shows us um, a, a problem also because he starts with what must I do? In his mind, he understands that I need to earn my salvation. I need to sh uh, show the world or I need to do things that would help me earn my salvation. So this question shows us that even those who have much in this world often still search for a deeper, for a lasting meaning. The more we try to gain things in this world, the more we feel there is an emptiness. The more we have and the more we're looking for more. And these guys is no different. He had everything he needed. He had a relationship. He had wealth. He had housing. He has everything that he needs, but something was missing. For the rich man, eternal life was important because it represented something he could not obtain through his usual means. These guys realized that, yes, I have money. I can buy anything I see in this world. But when it comes to what we call eternal life, money cannot buy it. And I don't feel that I'm ready for it. And I don't feel that I have it right now. So it was beyond the reach of his wealth and power. Eternal life is not something that you can go to the market and buy and then say, okay, now I have it. I don't have to worry about anything. But the rich man's question also betrays the misunderstanding of what it means to inherit eternal life. Notice how he frames his question. He said, what must I do? Like many people, he assumed, the rich man, he assumed that eternal life was something to be earned. I have to work for it or achieve. Like you have all your dreams. He said, I need to go to college. I need to get a degree. I need to achieve this and that. And in his understanding, he thought this is something that he needs to do. But he didn't know what to do. He didn't know how to do it. And then his question to Jesus was, what must I do? But Jesus' response here shifts the focus from human accomplishment to divine grace. Unlike anything in this world you have to work for, Anything you need to possess here, you have to work for it. No one is going to come to you and say, oh, here's the key to this car. Go, oh, it's yours. Or oh, here's the key to this house. It is yours now. You can go and enjoy it. Anything that you need in this world, you need to work for it. And that's why his understanding was also humanly craft, knowing that, okay, if everything that I need here, I have to work for it. I have to have the money for it. I need to know the right person to have it. Maybe eternal life also is the same thing. Jesus, what must I do? But Jesus shifted his question and tried to help him because the text said Jesus loved him. So as Jesus engaged the man in the familiar religious conversation that we have about keeping the commandments, the man confidently replies, Oh, all these things, I have kept them throughout my life. So I don't have any problem there. So Jesus, tell me something more. This answer doesn't really help me because I have done all these things. But here, Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. Out of love, Jesus challenging him. He said, Yeah, I know you have done all these things. I know you have kept all the commandments, but you lack one thing. And that one thing Jesus told him, go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. And finally, Jesus said, and come follow me. And now, Jesus hate some Part, a very sensitive part in this man's life because all his life he worked to gain all these things and then his identity is based on the wealth that he has his identity is based on 
people that he knows. You know, some people always say, like, I have, I, I have people in high places. Apparently, these guys also have people in high places. And then now, he built all his wealth, and then Jesus is asking him to go and sell them and then give them to the poor, then come and follow him. This is not just about giving up material possessions. It is about what has a hold over his heart. It is good to have things in this world. It is good to enjoy the things that you have in this world. But how much priority you give these things that you have over your relationship with God. And then that's the point Jesus was trying to touch with this man as they were having that conversation. And it is very significant for us today, this day. So Jesus' command reveals that while the rich man may have outward kept all the commandments the book of Moses asked him to, his heart was still bound to his wealth. His identity was in his wealth. And if he didn't have the things that he would have, he would feel that he was nothing in this world. So his riches were more than just financial security. Yes, we need all these things. They had become, first, his identity. They have become his sense of worth. Since I have all these things, then I feel like I am somebody. And ultimately, they have become his God. And at some point, what you have in life, you tend to worship them instead of worshiping the person in the first place who gave these things to you. So Jesus was offering this man not just a new set of rules, but a new life. A life that will give him a systematic way of knowing that you have relationship with Jesus Christ, then you have eternal life. It is not what you have. It is not what you do with what you have. But it is your relationship with Jesus Christ that can give you the eternal life you need. Letting go of things that we rely on for security, for comfort and identity... For the rich man this morning, that, that meant wealth. For others, it may be status, relationship, or achievement. So whatever it is in your life today, Jesus invites us to release our grip on these things and embrace the life he offers. And the life he offers is eternal life. So we are in the month of October, and a long time ago, or 500 plus years ago, a man by the name of Martin Luther was a member of the Catholic Church. He was a priest, he was a professor, and he was leading also the church. But in that time, the same way you see now in your pew, you have a hymnal and you have your Bible, it was not the case. In that time... The priest was the only one who had access to the Word of God. And he comes, he teaches it to you, whatever he says to you, that's what you know. And then at this time, all the church know you have to earn your salvation. So this man's question was not something out of nowhere. And then the life that Martin Luther was living at that time, the 16th century, was almost the same. The church was telling people, you have to earn your salvation. The church was telling people, you need, you need to do good works in order for you to earn salvation. And then Martin Luther, in his process, in his journey, trying to understand how this thing works, because everything that he does, so sometimes he, go, he goes hungry. Sometimes he gave everything that he has. But he still feels that there is some emptiness. He still feels that there is, he is not holy enough to be close to God. He is not worthy. He is not righteous enough. Because he said, the, the church was saying, you have to do all these things. And then he is doing them. But he still feels there is an emptiness. Until, as he was reading the Bible, because at this point, he was a priest. So he had access to the Bible. And then... In Romans 1, verse 17, he saw that they said, The just will live 
by faith. In Ephesians 4, I mean 2, verse 8 and 9, it said, It is by grace you have been saved. It is not through your work. It is all by grace. And the same struggle that man was having, or the same conversation that man was having with Jesus, and Martin Luther was having that internal conversation, trying to find a way, how can I be holy? And then the more I do, the more I give up, the more I let go of this world, I still feel this emptiness. So when he discovered these things now, and it was at the same time there was the printing press was invented, and he was able to translate the Bible that was in Latin to German, to German, and he was able to share this Bible all over. Then people now had access to the Bible to read for themselves. So it was not a secret anymore. The whole Word of God was available to everyone. So that's why we will be celebrating at the end of this month the Reformation. And that's why the Reformation was all about Luther rediscovered the gospel, the real meaning and the real message of the gospel. So today, what, this, what does this mean for us, this conversation Jesus was having with the rich man? And what does that mean for us as Christians today? So this passage isn't just, isn't just a story about one man, but it is a story also about the whole world that often tells about worth is found in what we have. This world, they said, you have to work hard. You have to gain anything that you need. And this world is not no different than the world that we live, I mean, they, Jesus was living with this guy. And then the message that Jesus said, yes, it is important that to have things to live in this world, but what is your priority? You can work for everything that you need in this world, but when it comes to eternal life, no work is needed. When it comes to eternal life, it is a gift to you and to me. It is a gift to the world. Through Jesus Christ, through the work, through the, his sacrifice, we have been saved by grace through faith alone. So for us, when we read this text, when we listen to this word, one thing we need to know, we know that this world is not our permanent dwelling. And one other thing we need to know is that eternal life. So what would it do to someone to have the entire world or to have all the wealth you need in this world? And then when you pass away, when you leave this world, and that's it. There's eternity. Eternity has no number. But in this world, sometimes you live one day, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years. And if you go to 100, that's a blessing. But if you had everything that you need in this world and then you live to 100, and what would that mean? What would that do to you if you do not have eternal life? Eternal life has no number. You will be able to live forever and ever. And then guess what? This promise of eternal life, it costs us nothing. This promise of eternal life costs us only to receive our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came, died, and rise again for us. And he said, if you believe in him, if you believe in the sacrifice that he has done for us, for the world, we will be saved. We will have eternal life with him. He said, I will go and prepare a place for you. And wherever I am, that's where also you will be. And then one day he will come back to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Welcome and enjoy eternity with me. Not 100 years, not 200 years, not 1,000 years, but eternity. What a wonderful news. If you were like this rich man, asking yourself question, or sometimes you can have a friend or someone who is un an unbeliever, 
who come to you talking about eternal life. Well, how can I do it? How do I know I'm a sinner. I know I've done so many bad things. How, what can I do? What should I do to inherit eternal life? And our answer is Jesus. Your eternal life, only Jesus. Through Jesus, you will have eternal life. There's nothing you can do. Your money will not give it to you. So let's think this through. If eternal life could be bought, and it was very expensive, it was only the millionaire, the billionaires in this world that would have eternal life. But thanks be to God, you may be a billionaire, and you may be, if, when you don't have money, how do you call it? Poor. You may be poor. In the eyes of the Lord, in his salvation realm, we are all the same as long as we believe in his son, Jesus Christ. What a wonderful news. What a wonderful message to know that we do not have to pay for our salvation. We do not have to pay for eternal life. Our eternal life is guaranteed. Our eternal life is secured through Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died for you and for me. It is important, like Luther did, he wrote, he translated the Bible, he translated uh, the New and the Old Testament to make sure that the whole world, first of all, the German people, but also the whole world had access to the Word of God. It is the same thing for us as we receive this good news. We know that we do not have to pay. We do not have to be a rich person to inherit the eternal life. How much more important for us to let our neighbors, let our friends, let our family member know that eternal life is free. It is for me. It is for you. It is for all the world. It is important for us to share this good news because it will save somebody's life. Not here on this earth, but also eternally. Let the word of God continue to stay in our heart. Let the word of God continue to guide us in this world as we continue to live our life and share the good news of the gospel that it is by grace that we have been saved through faith. It is, has nothing to do with our work. He has nothing to do with our wealth, but it is the grace of God. Amen? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son, your Son, Jesus Christ, who offers us eternal life, not through our works, but by your grace. Help us to let go of anything that keeps us from fully following him. Open our hearts to trust in your provision and to find our true treasure in your kingdom. Give us the strength to follow you, knowing that we find that knowing that we find life abundant and eternal life in you and in you alone. We pray all this in the name of your Son Jesus Christ. Amen.
Amen. That was fancy, right? Amen. Thank you, Brother Joe. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's time for us now to uh, receive our tithes and offerings. And for these, we will sing together, give thanks as we receive our tithes and offerings. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because it's given. Jesus Christ, His Son, and now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich, because of what the Lord has done. For us. And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us. Give Give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks. Now we ask for those of you who can please stand as we celebrate and thank God for the opportunity that He gives us to give back a portion of the blessing that He has given us to His work. We sing together, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just want to thank you, Lord. You've been God, we thank you for blessing us. Thank you for your mercy. And thank you for gifting us eternal life. With our own strength, with our own uh, wisdom, we could not gain, we could not earn our place in heaven. But because of your sacrifice, you give it to us freely as a gift. And we thank you for that. We thank you also for blessing us as we leave in this earth and prepare to share the good news to everyone we meet. And we thank you for the opportunity we have to bring back a portion of the blessings you've given us so that we continue to carry this good news that you've called us to be a part of. We pray that you continue to bless us, continue to give us more so that we continue to share according to the blessing you've given us. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We remain standing as we hear the blessings of God's people.
Amen. Now we sing the song of doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son. on the mountain is our closing hymn, hymn number 52. Go tell it on the mountain. Tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere Go Tell it on the mount, then the Jesus is born. While shepherds kept their watching over silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy light. Go. Hailed our Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Down in a